uh, and not some of the members. It has a September 2021 agenda, not the current one, and the wrong Zoom link. So it means this uh, meeting isn't very accessible to people who are looking on your website. Um, the, uh, the second comment I have is um, I just like to know about how the new uh, bicycle, the active transportation plan that you're reviewing today is accounting for the um, SMCTA application process uh, where you, you guys can apply with the county to get funding um, for infrastructure improvements listed in your plan. I'd also like to know how the um, your active transportation plan integrates with the Caltrans SHOPP projects that are uh, also in process right now for a couple of years ahead. So those are my three comments. Okay, uh, we will, Jules, um, is the contact information for Silicon Valley Bicycle Coalition still the same? Can we reach out to you in a response with BPAC members through there? Yes, you can You can uh, reach me through the Bike Coalition. I'm um, the uh, chair of the North County uh, chapter of the coalition, so you can reach me through there. Okay, as we find out these answers to that, um, definitely the website is a concern for this staff and this uh, committee, so we will get that corrected right away. Thank you for your other comments. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Jules. Have we, without any more public comment, can we move on to the consent calendar? And that would be the approval of the minutes of the January meeting. Do we have a motion to accept? Uh, has everybody read the minutes? They were very brief. Uh, is everybody any? If there's no comments, do I have a motion to approve? I have, I have a should... comment. Oh, no, go for it. I have a comment about the minutes. I was uh, reading the minutes. I'm not sure what, what's protocol, but they seemed really brief and they didn't incorporate uh, some of the suggestions that members had. Uh, is it typical that they don't incorporate our, our comments or are we able to change that? Um, if there was some comment that was missed, um, I mean, staff reviews the 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 video recording of this call and we are taking notes actively. So if there was something that was missed, um, we could um, go back and change them and add it, add it to it. Um, you can ask that um, it be amended uh, so that mm -hmm. uh, yeah. your comment, they come yeah, can, your... is it possible? I, I guess it's not particular for this past meeting, but is it possible we can have more detailed notes in the future? Um, we'll try to, because we've kind moved of away from discuss actually, what we discuss. Right. We've tried to move away from like the, you know, verbatim, like minute taking and move towards like action minutes, really. And then if there were anything pertinent, um, then that was, you know, that's what we you, we would put in there. Um, but now, if there's something that you want to amend to it, then please let staff know and then we'll proceed with that. No, that that's okay. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Well, I, I agree, uh, Daryl, that, that um, if there's something significant, yeah, they should be added into the minutes. Yeah. But uh, if you want to go back or you want, you want to delay this and uh, until they're updated, or would you like to, to move ahead and approve these minutes? What's your preference? Uh, let's move ahead and approve these minutes. As long as staff are recording these our, our comments. Gotcha. All righty, thank you. Um, so, uh, Daryl has made a motion to move ahead. Do I have a second? I'll second. Sorry, Natalie. Sorry, okay. and seconded. Thank you. All those in favor, say by saying aye. 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 Opposed. Okay, minutes are accepted. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, and so uh, Chris, if you could you know, include any pertinent questions or comments in the next minutes. Um, no, I think that was that, that was it. Let's uh, we could move on to administrative business, but uh, yeah. yeah, yeah. All right. So administrative business, active South City Bike and Master Plan update. 
we have the presentation? Yes, let me actually stop sharing. And while I'm doing that, I also introduce to you, Brett, uh, sorry, sir, for butchering your last name, Hondra from Alta Planning. Um, he has been working with us um, for in the kind of getting the active South City bike and bed master plan to this next actually really significant milestone. So hopefully you've um, received my email that had the link to this, to the plan as it was, and then we welcome any questions from you, including at the end of this presentation. So go ahead, Brett. Great, thanks, Chris, uh, and good evening, everybody. I'm glad to glad to be here. It's been a it's been a while since the BPAC has been updated on um, on the active cell city process. So excited to to um, have um, some pretty key stuff to present to you tonight. I assume you can all see my slide deck cover slide there. Great. Um, so yeah, what I'm going to do tonight um, is let me get into the application um, and kind of walk you through really the administrative draft plan, which is where we are at at this point. And, and um, as Chris said, that's that document has been shared with you all. And so that's sort of the internal draft. When you say administrative draft, that's kind of our internal draft um, that's just right before we're ready to, to get it out to the public. So we want to just make sure before it goes public that you know we have a chance to um, kind of get the last um, city uh, city staff comments on the document. And, and because of the timing of this meeting, we thought it'd be a good chance to, to check in with you all as BPAC members and see if there were any comments um, that, that we could um, incorporate before the plan um, went, went out to the public um, later this month. Um, it's February now. So I'm gonna walk you through the plan overview, um, talk about the recommendations, which is sort of the key you know piece of, of doing this. You know, I think the prior BPAC, um, updates were kind of existing conditions and, and the kind of initial parts, but I don't think you all really got to the point with the BPAC of getting a recommendation. So that's sort of where we are now with, with the plan. And then we'll talk a little bit about um, next steps and, and where, we're, where we're going with this. So um, just a quick overview of timeline, because it has been a while since we presented. Um, you know, this project's been going on for a while. It was kicked off in mid 2018. Um, there was a bunch of work in, you know, sort of fall, winter 2018, 2019, throughout 2019 in, like I said, existing conditions, collecting that data, kind of looking at the needs and the challenges and the barriers. Um, we did a whole bunch of public outreach in the fall, winter of 2018, 2019, went to a bunch of pop up workshops presented to this group here. I don't know, I have no idea if it was the same, if any of the same folks are, are on the BPAC that were back then, you know, it would have been my colleague, um, probably my colleague Otto who, who presented um, to this group. Um, and that sort of takes us through, you know, kind of mid 2019, we started to develop those recommendations and do another phase of, of public outreach. And the last, so the last time that you all have been updated was mid 2019. Um, and um, really in 2020, 2021, um, we talked with the city and, and given the general plan update and given COVID, um, there were some um, real reasons to, to kind of put a pause on the project. Um, and, and, you know, really initially it was COVID and then it, and then it really, in, in thinking about it, wanting to make sure that the active South City plan really aligned with the general plan update process. And so we did um, sort of go on hiatus for a little bit. Um, and pick this all back up in late 2021 to, to sort of wrap up the plan recommendations. And that brings us um, to, uh, to tonight. So, you know, a, a couple of years of catching up to do, um, but, but, you know, like I said, most of that, the project was actually on pause. And so we're really just picking up those recommendations, all of that outreach that was done um, sort of 2018, 2019, um, making sure that aligns with current plans and um, yeah we're ready to we're really excited and, and ready to get this plan um, out, out to the public uh, later this month so I'm going to walk you through the plan um, this is what it looks like here's the cover cover page and I'll just sort of walk you through the major sections and we can talk um, about some of the recommendations so you know like like any plan um, you know we start in, in talking about what what's the, out there right now you know what are existing conditions and um, you know, thinking about what that means for the needs um, uh, of the residents and employees and visitors and, you know, everybody who comes, um, comes into, into South City. Um, and so we've collected a bunch of data on that, 
on those exi existing conditions um, in terms of bikeways and programs and things. And, and one place we really like to start is, is looking at, you know, sort of policies. Um, and again, aligning this with the general plan is really important. So understanding what the intent of this plan is. And it's a high level master plan. Um, it's not going to get into the very, very specifics of designing projects. What we want to do here is make sure we're setting a vision for uh, bicycling and walking facilities in the city, that that vision um, takes into account the kind of state of the practice in terms of bikeway designs, right? Like the last bike plan the city did um, was before there were separated or protected bikeways, right? So that's a really important thing is to make sure we're incorporating the sort of latest um, design standards. Um, looking at development patterns, places people are going, places where um, development's happening, um, focuses around the transit station, transit connections, BART station, things like that. So, um, you know, looking at that high policy level, we came up with, you know, sort of these three, you know, tenets of what this plan is. It's really to connect the city, um, you know, and expand it. It's a bicycle and pedestrian plan. It's a joint, you know, active transportation plan really connects to transit, all the forms of transit that are in the city, BART, Caltrain, the ferry, um, SAM trans buses, um, and employee, employer shuttles as well. Um, we're looking at major barriers and, and how we can address those as, um, as sort of gaps in the network um, as well and make sure we connect folks. Um, we want to focus on, on, you know, really safety is another piece and, and, and a healthy community. So looking at the downtown, looking at the pedestrian piece, um, making sure that we're providing access to, to um, parks and schools and the Bay Trail and, and really key destinations around the city. Um, and, um, you know, and then and looking at, at the ways that this, this plan does improve safety for the, for the folks out there walking, biking, these are vulnerable users and we wanna look at, um, at those opportunities. So kind of at the high level, this set the, that sort of policy stage for um, what we looked at. We, so then we started collecting the information on existing bikeways, um, bikeways consisting of um, shared use paths. So things like the Bay Trail paved pathways, you have about 10 miles of those within the city. These are what we define as class one facilities. Bike lanes, so these are on-street facilities that are painted, um, about 13 miles of those um, in the city. And then bike routes, these are just signed routes where the bicyclist shares the travel lane with vehicles, about 13, or I'm sorry, about 24 miles of those. Um, in the city. So that's what's on the ground now um, and sort of comprises your, your current, um, you know, bikeway network. So with that, we then moved to thinking about uh, the walking network. Um, and we did an inventory of uh, pedestrian facilities, looking at where there were sidewalk gaps. Um, and uh, you can see that in, in red here on the map. I know these, these tiny little maps are sometimes hard, hard to see, but um, some of the major areas around, this, around the city where there are sidewalk gaps. Um, there are, I should note, there are a few gaps within the downtown area on some of the like alley type streets that aren't shown on here. So we didn't kind of get to that um, really fine level of detail. Um, but you can see, you know, even on the sort of main um, roadway net network, there are a number of places around um, around the city that, that have sidewalk gaps. And if we're looking at that sort of, again, back to connectivity and um, completeness, right? If we're looking at that completeness of a network, we wanna make sure we um, kind of consider these these types of gaps um, in providing for that uh, walking network. Next thing we do, I think, um, with the bike network in particular, you know, going back to the sort of existing map here, you know, and so that tells you one story, it sort of tells you what's on the ground. And, you know, bike routes really are just signs, right? So that, that's going to give you a certain type of experience as a bicyclist if, you, if you're out there sharing the travel lane. Um, and so what we want to look at is, is um, how comfortable is that bike? and street network for the cyclists that are out there, really. It's not just about the facility that's out there. Um, it's thinking about how does that facility um, function for different user types. And so we do what's called a level of traffic stress um, analysis. And that's um, really kind of looks at um, different types of bicyclist users um, from one to four, categorizes them from one to four, um, and then assesses the roadway network and the, and the current bikeway network in terms of how those facilities meet um, the needs of these different bicyclists. So an LTS-1 is really in all ages and abilities. That's a type of facility that a, a child, you'd feel comfortable letting your kid bike on. So that's like a separated path. Um, and it's- Are you changing slides? I'm, have I, have I not? 
what what slide are you seeing? I have been. We're in the zoomed in version of the uh, where you discuss the shared use path, bike lane, and bike route. Mm -hmm. I did also have one question. Yeah, go ahead, go for it. Just so you you had made a mention of trying to kind of quantify uh, like usable sidewalk that people can use. I, I don't know if that's like, if, if that's actually something we would put a number on, but one of the things that I was curious about is the extent that we choose to sort of quantify that to better understand where we have needs on, in that regard. Uh -huh. I, I wonder if we're adequately considering um, a lot of the neighborhoods in here that I think were built before people had as many cars as they do um, and basically have no functional sidewalk because the sidewalk is filled with cars. Yeah, I mean, that's a good point. It's not something we looked at in the analysis here. So this data is really just, are you, so are you seeing, maybe I should, are you seeing existing walking network on your screen? No, yeah, are. I Great. see that, yep. I think something funky happened with the screen share there, so I apologize. Um, so yeah, this data really is just presence, absence of a, of a sidewalk facility. Um, uh, but, but, but you make a good point about, you know, is that if someone's parking in that sidewalk, if that sidewalk is overgrown with vegetation, right? The sort of functionality of that um can become an issue so you know those are things we we can sometimes pick those up in in field work we obviously it, it's a challenge to sort of walk every street in the city so that's a place like hearing public feedback is really important and we can start to put in recommendations around enforcement right that becomes the sidewalks there it's just being used for <laughs> a purpose other than letting people walk right whether it's overgrown with vegetation or it has someone parking in it so that becomes a sort of code enforcement or compliance issue and we can we can point some recommendations to that. And particularly if we know there's certain areas of town where that's happening, um, we can kind of call that out. Yeah, I mean, I think part of it is like, you could probably use just how narrow some streets are as like a rough rule of thumb or a metric for like, this is probably a place where that's happening. Um, mm -hmm. In particular, the place that I think I have in mind is along Spruce as you pass, um, as you pass Sign Hill. Um, mm -hmm. you, you go on this one area where it's like, I'm terrified to go on a bike or walk there because there's basically no room for either. Um, so when a car passes, you're kind of like squeezing and it's just the whole thing. And that happens. I feel like there's a number of streets that are that way. I mean, I feel bad because I acknowledge that this is kind of just like a problem. There's a lot of folks living in houses these days. That's totally like the state of the way things are. And people have cars, they got to get around, but like, I don't know, like, I'm just interested in like actually thinking about it a bit because it does seem like it's a problem at South City in particular with maybe some aspect of our early construction seems to have in some of the neighborhoods. Um. Yeah, I mean, I think th th there's a couple issues I guess I'm thinking, I mean, one is the sidewalk. Is it a sidewalk issue or is it a sort of roadway narrowness issue? Because I, I think those are two different things, right? Cars that are parked and in the road maybe sort of just narrow if that creates a constrained feel for a cyclist, that's one thing. If a car's been parking on the sidewalk and blocking that for a pedestrian, that's a different issue, right? Those have different, I think. Oh yeah, totally. Right? It's cause yeah, the street is so narrow. Nobody, I mean, if they were to park on the street, there would basically be no room for a car to get through. So they hmm. end up parking on, on the sidewalk and okay. then you really have no room for anyone, whether cyclist or otherwise, cause there's not really a bike lane. Yeah. Um, are those, are those rolled curbs? Do you know? Curbs? Yes, they are. Yeah. Okay. So that, so there, you know, that's another, that's a design piece, right? That does um, tend to allow folks to, to sort of do that, park your wheel up on the curb kind of thing, or, or even farther. Um, and so that, that is a piece that we can look at as a design recommendation in terms of either, um, you know, rebuilding those or, or just, you know, certainly that's that's not a current design standard, but um, in places where that's a challenge, um, that's a piece we can call out as a design piece. So, so yeah, totally good, good, good comments, yeah. All right, so hopefully we're back on with the, uh, with the show here. Um, so are you seeing my pictures now, bike level of traffic stress? Yep. All right. Um, I think this is where I kind of got left off, but um, yeah, so so these these level stress um, categories range from kind of all ages and abilities, LTS1, which is really, you know, children's, uh, you'd, you'd be comfortable letting children ride on that. Um, LTS2 is really kind of for it, kind of an average adult rider would be comfortable riding on it. So it's something that provides the traffic volumes are relatively low. There's some facility or separation there. LTS3. Um, starts to be for, um, there may be a bike facility, like in this photo that's shown, there's Sharrows, right? So that's a bike route, um, but there's enough 
traffic kind of friction going on that that's really um, more intended for the the sort of confident cyclists um, would be the ones who are comfortable riding on that and then the lts4 are really streets that just have no bike facility at all and have a high enough traffic volumes that um, only the kind of strongest um, and, you know and most um, kind of most fit riders would feel comfortable riding there so we use this kind of um, this, this this range to to look at the roadway and and you know generally when we're doing an active transportation plan what we're trying to focus on are those LTS one and two those would be what we consider the low stress network right if you provide a network that kids and and really sort of um, kind of average adult riders um, are comfortable riding on you've provided a network that's pretty um, universal for folks and you can actually um, hopefully get a few more folks out there using the network. Um, and so that's what this map here shows is the results of that bicycle um, level of traffic stress where red is sort of the corresponding colors here, right? Red is the, the high stress, um, strong and fearless roads, which uh, correspond to your arterial roads primarily, right? Those are the, those are the major streets. Um, and then, you know, the trails um, are kind of on the other end of that scale, the class one uh, trails at the Bay Trail and some of the paths are the greens that you see. Those are, you know, very comfortable, completely separated from car um, facilities. And then you've got the sort of blue, um, the blues being the, the LTS twos um, and the, the, the yellow orange there being the LTS threes. Um, so it gives you a sense here of, of you know, it's, and this is all in some ways it's, it's common sense, right? It's not surprising your major roads that don't have a bikeway. Those are high, high stress or sort of low comfort types of facilities. Um, and so, you know, this gives, but this does give us a way to kind of look at, all right, you've, what's out there now? And then how does it actually feel? How does what's out there now actually feel? Um, to, um, to the folks. And then really, who are we trying to um, develop this network for? And if we're trying to build a low stress network, we have to kind of look at it that way. And so that's the next, um, the next map I'm gonna show here. And this is that sort of LTS one and two. So that low stress network, comfortable for kids, kind of average adult riders, that's what your network looks like if we look at it from that perspective, right? So that's the trails and that's kind of your really low traffic neighborhood streets they don't have a lot of cars um, on them they may not have a bikeway but um, traffic volumes are low enough um, or there is some kind of a of a nice you know wide um, buffered bike lane um, there and what are what are those really long green strips cutting across by sign hill i'm trying to figure out where that is because i want to use it <laughs> um is that like Miller Ave or something like that? I'm trying to figure out because I feel like cutting across all those places. I don't know anything that feels green. Um, yeah, well, that's good feedback too. Um, I'll have to zoom my map in. Yeah, I apologize. Some of the stuff is. Oh, no worries. If it's not easy to get to, it's not a big deal. It, the yeah, we can we can uh, you know once you have the plan, I, you know, please you know zoom in on the on the plan that you're, you're you have all this in that administrative draft. So we certainly want to get your feedback on this. But For you know, sure. I think I think the takeaway really is just. You know there are pieces of that low stress network here, but it's very disconnected, right? And it's it, and that's really what we're trying to do here is is how do we connect all those pieces up, right? Because if there's one missing link, then you've lost that comfort, right? If there's one stressful intersection or crossing or even a couple blocks, then you're not going to want to ride it, right? Even if, even if the rest of it is low stress. So it's really it's sort of looking at where those gaps are in the network and trying to focus our, our energy on, on connecting that up so you can leave your house and ride the whole way to your destination and not have to experience you know those sort of stressful um, situations, even if it's just for a block or two. That could be reason enough to not um, take, take that trip by bike. I was actually uh, hoping to point out that I think the... I love the classification of difficulty level, but the other thing that I think is important which is not just road condition, because that's also an issue in some places where the worst part of the road is where bikes generally are trying to ride. And it actually almost seems legitimately dangerous on anything other than maybe a mountain bike almost. Um, but you also wind up, especially on like Linden, uh, running into basically just like a limitless amount of just kind of small sketchy trash on the road, um, like things that could pop your tire um, that make even kind of the difficult sections that I feel like I would be comfortable riding, but like, kind of don't because I'm like, I'm going to get a flat and I'm going to have to stop or something. It makes me want to take another path, um, which isn't to say Linden needs to be a bike path, but um, 
just finding that yeah like there's just issues with mm -hmm. stuff on the ground broken bottles yeah um, yeah we have uh you know another good point you know maintenance maintenance matters um for for you know even especially with skinny tires even with even with mountain bike tires though right and, you know maintenance matters in these facilities we haven't quite calibrated yeah. our model to like include maintenance but um yeah it's something it's something we probably could you know for, for future is to find a way like if we understood you know how um how the maintenance was on some of those facilities to be able to calibrate it because it, it does all kind of play into the comfort uh, of the of the trip so um any other questions on this level of stress piece or, or... I have a question you yeah you just mentioned the model um i was looking at some of the streets then uh, and it's similar to uh, what community member bowen just said i somewhat disagreed with what it was what were the assumptions that were in the model like what data inputs did you put in or was it community input no, it's it's based on a standardized methodology. Is actually developed at, at San Jose State by a professor, you know, that ten years or so ago. And you know, it's 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 pretty standard practice within um, within the this the active transportation field to to use this. Um, but it, it looks at you know, at the at the baseline. It, it's looking at traffic volumes and speeds are kind of the major things you're looking at on the road, and then the presence of a bike facility or not, right? So the presence and the kind of width of that bike facility, right? So if you have a really low traffic road, you know, a neighborhood street that only gets a few hundred cars a day, you don't really need a bike designated bike facility, right? You don't really need a striped bike lane or a separate path or something, right? Because there's such few, there's such little car traffic, right? So that's the kind of facility, you know, that's just kind of a local street, right? So that could be a comfortable street even without a bikeway. As you start to add traffic to your road, Right, you sort of go up from a local road to a collector road, then you have to have a designated bikeway, and that's kind of what the analysis looks at. It looks at the type of road, what how it's classified, how much traffic is on it, and then the speeds of those um, those vehicles, um, and then compares that to whether there's a bike facility or not. Um, so, um, for a street, yeah, like an arter so like for an arterial street to be considered kind of low stress it would need to be a fully separated bikeway. It would have to have like physical separation to be considered a low stress facility. So almost like a path along the street, right? Cause you're saying, wow, this street has 15, 20,000 cars a day, 45 mile an hour speed limit. For that to feel comfortable for somebody, you basically have to have a fully separated facility. You know, even a bike lane on that street, if it's just painted, you know, there's a, that's, that's your sort of LTS three. Certain people are gonna ride that, they're gonna feel okay. But you're kind of, you're, you know, your sort of average person isn't going to ride that. And they're certainly maybe not going to ride it with their kid next to them. It's That's going to be a little bit kind of like, mm, I'm not feeling great about this. Cars are going by me really fast, right? And that's so that's where the sort of width of a bikeway and the separation counts. So, you know, it's all about math. And what it does is it just calculates kind of the widths and the of the facilities and then compares it to the traffic volumes and speeds. So with yeah, that... Yeah, I was just, I was going to comment. Oh, sorry. I'm sorry. With that, I just wanted when to you're add, talking about a um, LV one, are you talking about mostly Class Four or separated lanes? For an L, for an LTS one or yeah, LTS two, yeah. yeah, it would be a Class Four exactly, um, or a path or a path or a Class One path is what you'd be looking at, um, or a or a neighborhood street that has very very low traffic. Say. Okay thousand vehicles a day or something lower than that right daryl i don't know if i finished answering your question oh there yes <laughs> yes yeah, sorry just to build off of uh, what, how, your response i'm looking at um i live in the westboro neighborhood and i see that most of westboro which is basically a traffic sewer connecting pacifica and highway 280 is a confident adult when it should probably be fearless adult because there's a ton of cars Whereas Geller, which is a perpendicular street, is a fearless adult level. Four. And even though it's a really wide street, the traffic volumes are very small, maybe one or two cars every few minutes. Um, and I, I'm just questioning the methodology and, and how, how you came to this, because I think this is a level of bicycle stress is probably one of the main indicators for how to make a better um, bicycle, bicycle network. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I mean, we can, I can, I think if you provide those comments on the admin draft URL, you know, we can look at, at the data um, and see if, if there's something, you know, we missed in, in that, but, you know, we just sort of pull, we pull sort of traffic, um, you know, volume and lane data sort of citywide is how we have to do it for this, so. And, and I think that goes without saying, so that's why we wanted to make sure we bring this to BPAC, so just you get the the, the first look and then we had we set aside some time for you to take a look at the admin draft and then provide your comments to Brett and then to us yeah. uh, so that we can then publish a more like the, a draft that incorporates all of your feedback because this is exactly what we're missing if there, there's a street that you think that we has been mischaracterized um, then let us know yeah so, and just a heads up, I can't see the chat or not easily. So if there's something I'm missing in chat, just shout out your questions. Um, so I'm gonna move, if, if there's no other questions, I'll move. Brett, um, yeah. Brett if I may go back yeah. to that one, I'd have one question. Uh, one of our biggest problems here in South San Francisco is 101, dividing the city in half. Mm -hmm. Getting across that is, is very awkward. I see on your plan here, you have, there's a green line right in the middle across 101. What is that? I can't make it out what street that is. Crossing 101 in the middle of your map. Yeah. Is that Grand? Is that East Grand? Mm hmm It looks like it's by the Caltrain station. Oh, is oh. that the new uh, way to bike through, maybe? The new uh, the new path, the under under the Caltrain or whatever? Uh, yeah, it is Grand. Um, okay. So that that's would be the only thing I, I don't could know think that it's connecting. Safe. I don't know if it's showing it fully connecting here or there, but um, is it? I actually don't know. That's is that Miller? I, I'm yeah. I'm sorry. Some of the maps are just a little challenging to read here, but we'll uh, we'll take a look back in here, and make sure that all makes sense. I think that's actually Miller um, Street, but it's not showing a full connection across the the 101. It's sort of just ending there is what I'm seeing in my zoom here. Yeah, so, you know, I think, you know, these these analytics are part of the story. I mean, public, someone mentioned public input. I mean, that's another big part is just sort of hearing from folks. And, and then, you know, I think at the end of the day, um, you know, we just wanna make sure the recommendations are in the right places. So these are all just tools that we use to get us to the recommendations. Um, and there may be some underlying, you know, kind of weirdness with the data. We hope that it, it it sort of conveys the right story, and I think we want to take a look and, and adjust if possible. But um, I would also say, you know, the main thing we want to get to is like, are the recommendations solid? Are those in the right places, and are those supported? Um, so we'll keep moving. Um, you mentioned barriers, Frank. So you know, this was a good segue to the next slide. Is just um, you know, kind of looking at at um, how the crossings of um, you know, El Camino Real, of the 101 um, and um, of the 280 are, are, are create those, those sort of stressful um, points that serve as barriers. You, know, you can get through them, but they're you know, basically what we'd call kind of a stress barrier. You know, it's just not a comfortable um, uh, type of trip to make. And, and so those, those types of things may be preventing people from, from choosing to bicycle if they have to go through those um, intersections or interchanges. And so, you know, we called out a few of them um, here on the major corridors. And again, it just you sort of putting this, overlaying this on the network, it starts to paint that picture that, uh, that again, you, even if you have, um, in situations where you have a designated bikeway, if, there, if, the, if there's a facility or a road that creates that kind of stress barrier, it might be preventing people from, from really using that. Um, so another thing we do uh, through the plan is, is do a safety analysis. So for both biking and, and walking, we are looking at, um, at historic collisions. We generally look at about five years um, of collisions um, and uh, you map those out and you know, try to look at if there's any, any patterns um, and, and places that we need to focus um, focus on for for improvement. So this map here, uh, you can see in those in the blue and and darkish lightish blue hexagons um, show the collision points, and then the reds are sort of our outlines of some of the key areas where um, we noted some some higher um, collisions. Um, there's a pedestrian couple. There are Unfortunately, some pedestrian fatalities, those are shown in, in red um, dots. Um, you, can, you can kind of um, 
a little tough to see again at this at this scale, but those are on the maps as well. So average collisions, 25 pedestrian collisions a year, um, an average of 15 bicycle collisions. Um, and that's about 20% of total um, vehicular collisions that occur um, in the Is city. that vehicles hitting bicyclists or bicyclists hitting pedestrians or? Uh, that's that, that those are primarily going to be vehicles hitting pedestrians or vehicles hitting bicyclists. Sometimes there are a sort of a bike pedestrian um, type of collision that that may happen, but most of what most of these numbers are are vehicle related um, with either bike or pedestrians. Do, um, do you and, happen to know if we've uh, entertained or have any intention of doing any like speed bumps or stuff say along grand or linden like avenues where i think it's pretty flat and you can actually gather up quite a lot of speed despite there being a lot of pedestrian and bike traffic along those areas i don't know if we've ever tried to kind of smooth that out a little bit I defer to chris on that one mm. uh, i mean we uh, frequently in our uh, traffic advisory committee i don't know uh, if someone from engineering was in there is that we normally field requests for speed bumps on like more neighborhood streets. And the process usually is that once we receive that kind of request, we'll do um, some, you know, data collection, uh, you know, kind of like a speed radar, then determine if that, you know, like vehicles on that specific street frequently exceed the speed limit. Mm. Um, and we go by like a percentile of um, like of that metric. And then it, that usually will determine whether a speed bump is warranted at that stretch of street. Got it. Got it. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Hi, Chris. I'm online. Uh, this oh, is Bianca. Bianca. Yeah, you described it perfectly. So just confirming. Yeah, thank you. And, and we do have some of those kind of traffic calming recommendations built into our toolkit of, of design on the pedestrian side. So certainly, um, yeah, that, that those 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 types of designs the city has has available to to apply those. Um, uh, and and speed management is is an important part of of ensuring a safe pedestrian environment. So, um, yeah, that you know, bike and pedestrians combined represent twenty percent of total crashes. Um, so that that's really you know disproportionate to their kind of use of the roadway network, right? They're they're probably you know closer to you know five or six percent of of um, you know, in terms of mode, but then represent 20% of, of crashes. Um, so, you know, that's, that's showing that, you know, they're sort of overrepresented um, in crashes. And that's, you know, that's not unusual. That's a pretty typical um, finding that, that we see when we're doing these types of analysis. Um, it just shows the, the need to really focus and, and center safety and, and recommendations. And, you know, probably not surprisingly, you know, we see major crossings um being being challenges um in places that we we have crash patterns el camino real um and then the downtown area had a um, um saw a number of crashes and you know some of some of that um is due to there's just a greater number of people walking you know there is a bit of of just the 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 usage um will um tend to to produce more crashes if you have more people out there um but we want to make sure still we're creating a safe um safe walking uh, and biking environment here. So just some, some takeaways from the safety, 45% of all fatal crashes um, involve pedestrians. Um, some of the peak times, you know, uh, again, probably not surprisingly, they, they correspond to kind of peak commute um, periods back when we all used to commute. You know, this, these findings are from a couple of years ago, but again, the, the times that vehicles are active, the times that people get in their cars to go to, work or come home, pick up from school, they're the same times people are, are, are out walking, right? And, and so that's, um, you know, those, those, those tend to overlap um, kind of similar with bikes. Um, and then speeding, you know, to the point about speeding, the number one, uh, when, when we looked at the causes of the crashes, number one cause of, um, of crashes of a vehicle and a bike head was, was a speeding related cause. So really important to do that speed management piece. So in terms of kind of wrapping up, trying to get towards the recommendations here, just you know, key findings from you know this this existing conditions and and, and needs um, kind of exercise that we went we went through early in the plan process was, you know, what what are we trying to 
to, to look at and how can this inform our recommendations? You know, looking at that connectivity back to the goals of the plan, trying to connect between downtown and the Caltrain and BART stations, um, enhancing the crossings um, and connections to the Centennial Trail, you know, sort of major spine trail there. Um, and then looking at some additional north-south um, bike route opportunities that would that would parallel the 101 and connect to San Bruno BART. Um, Intra-neighborhood accessibility, just trying to, to find some ways to um, provide some alternatives to the real major road corridors that people could, um, you know, walk or bike along. Um, and so those neighborhood routes become a, a consideration. Um, and then making sure it's not just within the neighborhood, but you can connect across those, those routes and connect between neighborhoods. Um, and then something we haven't talked about, you know, thus far is, is just the topography, right? And so the hilly terrain, you know, like we talk about comfort with bicyclists, right? I mean, the, the terrain and the slope is another piece that can influence somebody's choice of a route. And so I'm um, looking at routes that, um, you know, as best as possible um, could, could provide some options so you could get around town without um, doing major hill climbing. Um, connecting to destinations, um, again, you know, Bay Trail, the Centennial Trail, um, and then safety, you know, looking at um, just some of those key safety findings, um, the crossings of the highway, um, just crossings of, of intersections that, that have a lot of traffic vehicle volumes and have a lot of people walking through them, and then opportunities to connect um, around schools um, in particular um, to encourage safe routes to school. So that was sort of the existing conditions findings. I um, wanted to just give you all a kind of an outreach summary. So it's compressing a lot of outreach into to one slide here. Um, but um, you know, in terms of, of what we did, we did we did a pretty extensive number of, of meetings and workshops, a lot of pop-up meetings, which we've really found to be um, you know, more effective in, in kind of reaching people where they are already gonna be rather than making them come to, to our workshop. Um, most of the outreach, or I guess all the outreach was, you know, pre-COVID when we could do that um, type of outreach without um, being masked up. But, um, you know, 2018 through 2019, um, we, we did a couple rounds of, um, of workshops. And so just some of those events are listed here. So, um, yeah, I uh, hope, you know, maybe that some of you participated in these, but, but these are um, just the ways that we were gathering that public input. And, and so um, it, it, it was a pretty extensive um, amount of outreach that took place. Um, and then, you know, just some of the findings we heard from, from folks that really reinforced what we saw with the data, you know, desires to have those better connections, connections across the highway, um, be able to get to the trails um, from, you know, folks wanting to go from their house and, and connect to those trails and have those recreational or, or transportation um, options, slowing vehicle speeds around schools, um, you know, and just kind of overall, you know, pedestrian, um, pedestrian comfort. So nothing, um, yeah, I mean, this is all nothing that's really surprising. These are all just, again, things that I think reinforce what we see with the data. And, and um, it's just good to have that additional point um, from the public input to, to support um, the recommendations that we go through. So, um, you know, I mentioned the bike facility types at the beginning and just um, again here, we're talking about as we go into the recommendations, we're talking about shared use paths, what we call class ones. Uh, striped bike lanes are class twos and the, those are minimum of five feet. Sometimes they're six feet wide, you know, but you basically have one stripe um, on, uh, on either side. Um, and they can be either along a curb or they can be along a parking lane, depending on whether there's parking on the street. Um, class 2B are what we call the a buffered bike lane. And so that, that's, again, it's just a painted lane, but it has an extra buffer um, area, as you can see, that hatched buffer area. Um, the buffer is often between the bike lane and the travel lane, although if you have enough width, you could put a buffer between the bike lane and the parking lane. Um, but generally, you know, the travel lane where the vehicle speeds are greater are, are, is the piece that we want to generally provide that buffer from. So it's sort of an enhanced um, striped bike lane. Class threes are the bike routes. So again, just signed. They might be marked with a sharrow on the pavement, but um, the bike is sharing the traffic lane with a with the car. There's no, no designated space for the bikeway. So those are really more most appropriate on the lower traffic 
lower traffic volume streets. Um, as you start to get um, too many car uh, volumes and as car speeds get you know above about 30 miles an hour, the, the shared class three type of facility just starts to not work as well. It becomes more um, uncomfortable for folks to ride on. Um, class threes are bike boulevards. So these really are those true neighborhood bike routes that are on a very low, low traffic neighborhood street. It doesn't get a lot of cars. Um, and those are places that we can provide. We talked, I think in, in one of the earlier slides, I talked about those kind of alternative routes to being on the main route, main roads, the main arterials. So that's what these bike boulevards can, can provide, right? Some, some folks just feel really comfortable riding on a nice quiet neighborhood street. And that's the intent of a bike boulevard. Um, but it's really key that the traffic volumes are low enough and that the traffic speeds are managed, right? Um, you don't wanna have lots of cars going by and you don't wanna have those cars going by quickly or you've not created that um, sort of comfortable low stress um, space. Um, and then finally, class four are these are the separated um, bikeways. So those have a physical separation, um, either uh, bollards, bollards can be plastic bollards or sometimes it's planters, or it could even be a parked, a lane, a lane of parked cars that provide that separation between the bike way and the vehicle travel lane. Um, but those provide that kind of highest level of physical separation for a cyclist. Um, and these are really, you know, most appropriate on, on more major streets where you have those higher volumes and, and want to create that um, kind of separated space. Um, and, you know, one, one challenge with the class fours are driveways can be a challenge. So if you have a street with lots and lots of driveways, it can be a challenge to build them because you have to provide that access and some uh, site distance from each of the driveway um, locations. Um, so that's, uh, that is a consideration, but um, they do provide that, that separation. So with that, again, an, a, a map that's probably really hard for you all to see here, but um, this is our recommended bikeway network. So it includes, um, you know, segments of each of those, um, those bikeway types, um, bike class and additional class one paths. Um, class two bike lanes and the buffered bike lanes, um, bike boulevard routes, and then some separated bike, um, separated class four bikeways as well. Um, yeah, you know, and the intent of this is a, is a continuous uh, network that, um, that links up. Um, we've, you can see the purple are the bike boulevards. Um, I think those are, you know, sort of clearly visible. So those are those are in the neighborhood areas and those are intended to provide some additional neighborhood connections where you might not have folks that really want to be on the on the main streets, um, on the on the main arterials. Um, you know, we have connections through downtown, we have connections um, into the east east of 101 area. And so um, just trying to trying to provide that complete and, and connected network. Um, I will point out the um, yellow sort of highlight overlay you see, um, which are primarily on the class uh, four routes or what we're calling the study corridor. And, and the intent of that is really to acknowledge that, um, you know, class fours can be a challenge to implement. They sometimes require removal of traffic lane or parking lane. Um, and there's some additional outreach that, that will need to be done with all these projects really. But, um, you know, the class fours in particular are, are ones that can require a sort of higher level of design and outreach. And so we did wanna note those as something um, that, that is gonna require some additional study um, just to give the, the city um, you know, the, the flexibility in, in terms of implementation and, and just make sure that the, it, it's acknowledged that these facilities are gonna require you know, additional study and outreach um, before they can be um, um, implemented. Yeah. I, I had a comment these days, um, bike lanes, are serving more than the purpose for bicyclists. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of multi other kinds of modes of transportation yeah. that use the lanes. Have we considered the new uh, types of small vehicles who uh, are either can be foot powered or electric and their use and in, in these lanes and how that will affect, you know, the bicycle traffic? Yeah, I mean, that's, it's a really great point. Um, and, you know, I think we've considered them in that we generally are going to recommend um, a bike lane that's as wide as it possibly can be. And, and the separated bikeways, um, I think, provide for that experience. Um, 
So yeah, I, I think generally in, what we've seen is that really well-designed um, bikeways, bike lanes, or cycle tracks, separated class four bikeways provide a good experience for a, whether that's a bicyclist on a regular pedal bike, whether that's a bicyclist on, a, on, a, uh, on an electric bike that's pedal assist, whether that's someone in a scooter, um, a, a bike lane that's designed really well um, can provide and accommodate for all of those uses. Um, so I think it's a good point that you make though, that, that we need to acknowledge in the plan, um, those other uses and the potential for those other uses to be in these facilities. But I think ultimately the design, good design is good design and it's kind of universal. Um, you know, we don't know what the next kind of new mobility device is that, that's going to come out, right? But what we want to do is just make sure we're providing enough space. It's, it's usually the, the, that width that provides people the comfort to kind of maneuver around each other. So you can have someone on a scooter who might be going a little faster because they just have to twist the, the handle um, or someone who's pedaling their own bike um, and might be going a little slower. If you have enough space in the facility, all, those kind of modes can, can interact um, safely. You know, they're all they would all be considered kind of slow modes. I think that's how we look at it. They all really fall under that sort of slow mode um, type of um, type of design. Hopefully that answers the question. Does anyone have questions on the, again, I know it's a little hard. Um, I miss the days. This is the worst part about COVID is we have to do this on the screen because normally we'd print a huge map out and we get to gather around the table and, and roll up our sleeves. And that's the best part about doing this is we could all point and get the Sharpies out and circle stuff and, and doing it virtually is is a, is a challenge here. But yeah, uh, Chris promised us that two years ago. So we're still <laughs> waiting. Uh, I haven't forgotten Chris. Now, uh, but uh, Brett, while we're chatting and this is an opportunity because um, it's been two years since we've met. Uh, we have an issue come up this past year with a developer at uh, 140 Airport Boulevard, and he's proposing a bike design for to use a pedestrian walkway from Baden Avenue to San Mateo Avenue on Airport Boulevard as a two-way bicycle pedestrian passageway. Mm. And the passageway is less than eight feet wide. I wonder before we wrap this up, would it be possible to have you guys look at that and come up with a critique or an, uh, is it, am I blowing it out of proportion or is this not acceptable? I think maybe using Airport Boulevard, the, one of the lanes, it's a three lane highway, use one of the, I, use, I cycle that way and I use the, the lane. I would never think of riding on the sidewalk. I would have got beaten up back home for doing such a thing. So why, I, I just have very, very uncomfortable approving it without having some experts look at it. Yeah, I mean, I'll defer to, to Chris and, and staff if, if they want us to take a look at that. You know, it, it doesn't sound like what I would call, you know, best practice, but I, I also like, you know, kind of coming into a cold, I don't have all the context of, um, gotcha. it, you know, there are certainly times when, you know, sidewalk use is, is, has been recommended because there isn't a better alternative or because the roadway travel lane is, isn't really considered to be that safe. Um, and it's certainly very less than ideal, but um, yeah, kind of probably should reserve further comment until. Yeah, no, I, I understand. I appreciate that. And I might be blowing it out of proportion, but I just, I'm very un uncomfortable with it. They want to put some fancy lights in there, which is like uh, putting lipstick on something, you know? I don't know. It, uh, it makes me think of the pass on uh, Palo Alto going from downtown to the campus. If you walk along University Ave, they have a very similar uh, sort of, at least if I recall correctly, a very similar sort of under a bridge sort of thing where you're going through a path like that of similar width. And I think in their case, they actually just mark it as you should dismount and walk your bike through because it's dangerous to ride through. And I think most people do that. But yeah, in this case, they were talking about it as an actual bike path. So that, that might actually be a little dangerous. I'm not really sure. Hmm. I think that just to echo like the concerns from uh, Chair McCauley and you, Vice Chair Bowen, that um, 124 Airport, like obviously we went through Planning Commission, went through City Council approval um, prior to us having this. And even then it's like at, at this junction, yes, we are at a big milestone, but it is still a largely unapproved like uh, master plan. Uh, but like if, if you look on your screen, like Airport Boulevard is calling for at least a class four, which is something that we will look into in the future. Um, what we've tried to make sure we condition 
for for the PS Office Park project, the 124 Airport, is to you know make sure that they lean heavily more heavily on those pedestrian improvements at the intersection that they were promising to uh, and to follow through on those, and then make sure that not to preclude or not make sure that we can still uh, go in and you know eventually put in like a class four type facility here. So or even, like even a bike lane like that, but because of the nature of that roadway having so much traffic, truck traffic, all kind of converging onto, you know, to use the, the freeway, it will, it fell out of the scope of something the project had control over. Um, so they can't, they couldn't just say like, hey, we would, you know, convert this to a class four right, right away, uh, because obviously there's um, other factors going into that. Um, so, you know, like it's something that we're making sure that when they proceed with the project and construct it, that when they put in their fancy lights in the tunnel and add those signage that says like dismount because we don't want to create that hazard for anyone walking in in the tunnel and i think that was the intent that they uh should have communicated more clearly but i don't think it, it got there yeah all righty oh, is this the time for questions it I believe yeah, so. I mean, there's there. Any there, time is a good time for. Yeah, questions. anytime. If you have if you have them on the bikeway network, I can keep moving through um, to talk about the pedestrian network. But if you have something on the bike network, um, no, no. Okay. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm. I'm, it to the I'm, end. I'm rambling on here. I'll I'll, I'll keep this moving here because. No, I appreciate you me. taking all the questions. I, I recently got my bikes fixed up, so I feel like I'm brimming with like observations about South City's bike connectivity, and mm -hmm. I, I, I find the whole network really exciting, but like. I just hope we actually spend time following sort of the green paths and making sure that they're really what we think they are, because I feel like it's easy to kind of look at some metrics and they could miss something, um, kind of to the point that I think uh, one of our guests here, Jules, commented on, um, like there might be something we're dropping on the floor here and maybe we can do a better job if we commit to really like keeping an eye on these networks, making sure the roads are healthy yeah. and clean. Yeah, because Brett has already said, you know, if we don't, if we like, the, you can't get from Sunshine Gardens to Orange Park because you can't get across Westboro, right? Yeah, yeah. So yeah. if we don't keep an eye on it, like you're saying, it mm -hmm. won't be useless. <laughs> yep, yep. Um, yeah, so let's shift up, you know, pedestrians um, and the pedestrian improvement. So we, we've characterized our pedestrian improvements um, in, in some of these focused areas or, or focused project types. Um, so I'm looking at, uh, let's see if I, so this is sort of the, the way we've characterized the different project types, probably better to look at this slide first. So, you know, looking at roadway crossings, you know, and mid block crossings um, are, are a real um, challenge and a, and a place that often you see um, safety um, issues, particularly when those are uncontrolled. Um, you know, it's a crosswalk that's between intersections and that doesn't have a signal control. So it's just relying on vehicles to yield to a pedestrian. That's often where you see um, where you see collision patterns here. So um, those are those are a focus area. High volume pedestrian areas in general, places around you know the downtown schools. The, the transit the transit centers um, those are places you just have a lot of people walking so even if you have traffic signals you have kind of standard intersections just this sort of interaction of lots of people and probably lots of cars going in there tend to create areas that that can have safety issues and and we certainly did see that in the in the crash numbers those were places that it kind of popped up freeway interchanges similarly right you have cars that are either coming off of a high-speed freeway um, or kind of gearing up to, to get on a ramp, um, and that's just a that's just a place that that's sort of inherently inherently challenging for um, for people to to walk through. Those ramps are often designed for that sort of speed, um, and not so much for for the sort of pedestrian um, visibility or, or safety. Um, signalized intersections, you know, again, the, those have signals. They have a con they have traffic control, but if the volumes are high enough, there's there's certainly things we can look at with the design to make those safer. Um, and then sort of looking at the different kind of major minor streets. So we've tried to group things together um, in, in terms of those toolkits and um, in terms of areas around schools that should be enhanced, crossing improvements, whether those are, those are sort of those uncontrolled or intersections, um, areas around, um, you know, just enhancing the pedestrian environment around the transit center. Um, and then those, you know, back to that sidewalk gaps 
um, map, you know, the, trying to make sure we fill those sidewalk gaps and make sure that the walking network, right? That's the sidewalk. It's your it's your walking network that that's as continuous and connected, and you can walk from point A to point B without without gaps or interruptions. So that's what this map shows. You know, pedestrian improvements just by their nature are very um, are often very small scale, very localized. Um, and so trying to group these into typ typical or, or um, consistent project types just helps us um, to kind of organize um, what are often very kind of small, discrete um, improvements here, as I've shown in this toolkit. Um, and then just you know, showing a comparison back to that, um, you know, one, one way we look at this is how, how have we done with our recommended network, right? So back to that existing network, um, level of traffic stress I showed a, a few slides ago, um, you know, and, and and actually I should have shown the other the other slide with the green, right? So that disconnected green we saw before, this is based on the recommended network, right? So you've got that green, you've got a lot more connectivity in the greens, right? That level of stress one and two network is now much more connected, um, and it goes to all places of the city. So again, this is if you built out, if you built you know, this all out as shown with class fours on the arterials, with nice uh, bike boulevards through your neighborhoods that are slow, um, you know, quiet, comfortable streets um, with those crossing points across the 101 um, and the improved connections through the intersections and interchanges, you would get to sort of this in terms of a level of stress for your community, right? So this is the aspiration. This is where you want to get to, and this is how you get, um, you know, the families and the kids to be able to ride from their house, out their front door, go to school, go to downtown to, to hang out or shop, go to the Bay Trail um, and, and kind of get around town um, and, and not have a stress point um, in, that, in that trip. Talked a lot about uh, infrastructure for bikes and heads. Don't want to forget programmatic, um, the non-infrastructure things, things like open street events, um, you know, uh, kind of pop-ups, bike parking, um, you know, things like the bike-friendly communities, uh, Vision Zero policy is something the city um, has adopted now and, and, and that, you know, ties directly to these safety ways to evaluate safety data and, and really um, update progress. So there's a number of recommendations in the plan that are focused on these non-infrastructure pieces and, and how we can support the infrastructure side um, of bike and pad. And then the last piece, you know, is really the prioritization. So that's really about how we take, you know, this big network um, of bike projects, right? That's a lot of miles of new stuff. All those dashed lines are new proposed things. So it's a lot of miles. Um, and this is a lot of new proposed pedestrian improvements. So how do we take that and, and help the city prioritize it? And I think, um, I think it was Jules, the first commenter, right? Talked about how's this plan going to align with the, the SMCTA's funding programs, right? And that's exactly where we want to take this. How do we take that big list of projects and, and sort of put it into these categories of like, these are the ones we want to focus on first. Maybe it's some of them are low hanging fruit, easy. Maybe some of them are just real priorities. And we want to put a lot of energy into going after grant funding because they're so important from a safety or connectivity standpoint. Maybe these are ones that developers are gonna take care of. So we sort of put those over here and know that it's gonna take a little time maybe, but they're gonna get built and paid for by someone else, right? And so we kind of need to organize the projects in a way. And so, um, you know, that's the piece, honestly, we need a little of your help on, I think as you review or is helping us. Um, we, did a, we did a first pass at it um, in the admin draft. I don't think it's quite there. I don't think it quite represents where we wanna go in terms of, some of those key initial connections. And so I just would encourage you all as you're, I mean, in your comments today for sure, but as you're reading through the document as well to think about things that you see as just key priorities. Hey, this is a project that we really should really focus on now um, um, or a corridor that really needs some, some improvement kind of in the short term. Um, and, and that will help us to organize into some of those buckets and know, um, yeah, give the city some direction in, in where they should focus their energies, right? Because every one of these projects requires, you know, I, I mentioned those study corridors. I mean, that's a real thing to do a class four project over a mile or two or several miles. That's a big effort of design and outreach. 
and and getting that um, you know through through the engineering and then going to that's that's years of a process to get that that in the ground and we can look at sort of more quick build opportunities and that's another piece you know the city is looking at is how do you use sort of lower cost materials to get things in the ground quicker but there's still it still takes time to build out a network right and this plan is a longer term vision so we want to hear from you i think about what are the things should be that should be the focus like for the next five years where should the city focus their energy to start um, getting this network on the ground um, design guidelines so this is all the good fun you know graphics that kind of support what we're doing all the best practice stuff um, yeah there's a whole there's a whole um, kind of appendix on this encourage you to flip through that um, and this just helps you know the, the city as they're thinking about you know what's how should we standardize some of this and and, and, and build out these facilities both by comparing and that's it next steps um, you all have the admin draft. Um, and so what we'd like to ask for um, is, is to get comments um, in, in the next two weeks by February 16th to get your comments, send those over to Chris. Um, and then um, we're targeting the, that next week of February 21st to get the full public draft plan released. Um, that's a little dependent on how many comments you all give us by the 16th. Um, you know, don't hold back, but if we get a ton and ton of comments and we have to look at some things again, that. February 21st date might slip because we just want to make sure we get the document right before it goes to the public. Um, but, you know, assuming it goes out late February, we'll have a public review period. We'll um, do another round of revisions based on what we hear from the public. Um, and then this gets to go through the adoption process. Um, and so, yeah, we're looking at sometime this spring to get this um, adopted to council and on its way. So thanks for listening. Um, yeah, I'm happy to, to go back to any slides and, and answer any questions y'all have. Do you happen to know if lighting is considered an input in any of the modeling that you do for the safety of roads? It's, um, yeah, it's not an input like in the modeling we are looking at. I mean, it's certainly a really important factor. And as we're looking at specific crash um, data pieces, it's something that we might see that lighting's a, an issue in a, in a crash area. And we could, you know, kind of dig into that more. Um, it's mm -hmm. not something that's in any of the, the kind of models that we've looked at um, today, though. I see. Because, yeah, that's that's certainly something that I think I consider in trying to pick my paths through places is if it's like really late at night, if it's not well lit at all. Like, yeah, I don't, you know, it's. um, Yeah. I mean, you actually, too. What, you, what you describe is different than what I was thinking. I was thinking of, you know, in terms of like a, say a crosswalk, right? Sometimes you get crashed that data and there's, there's, cro there's lighting issues that could contribute, could be a contributing factor to a vehicle crash, someone trying to cross the road and it's not well lit. But, but I think what mm -hmm. you describe more of the, you know, and that's what I'd call, so that's vehicle safety or, or road safety, right? What you're talking about is what I'd call like more personal safety, right? How comfortable does this corridor feel? And yeah, both, yeah. both equally, both important for different reasons um, as you're thinking about whether you're gonna make a, a walk or bike trip. Yeah. I think the other thing that I observed, and this is maybe just an mm -hmm. issue of scale, but I noticed that all of the sort of paths that we map out are really addressing kind of more the, um, I guess is the term arterial, like main roadways and like, all the neighborhoods throughout South City and the safety of various streets, cleanliness of various streets. Like, I don't know how much that sort of input is sort of, if we're thinking through stuff like that and when we're doing these models or if that's just like too much data to work with and we're just focusing on kind of like the big easier wins. Cause I know like I'm smack dab in the middle of a neighborhood that I feel like can be a bit of a mess to get out of. And once I'm at the artery, it's good. But that path from there out is, leaves a lot to be desired, I suppose. Yeah. So. Yeah, I mean, we are limited by the data that we can get, right, sort of easily, uh, you know, yeah, we spend yeah. a lot of time and effort trying to clean up data or, or, or sort of go into the weeds on things. So, yeah, I mean, that's the balance. We try to strike a balance between being able to do things citywide with kind of easily gatherable data around that's, you know, in the city's GIS, it's kind of basic roadway features. And then we really rely on your all's input to kind of give us that next layer of like insight to things that we just either the data led us in the wrong direction and it happens, you know, or we just can't get to that level of detail and we still need to focus on it, so. Yeah, Brett, I wanted to ask you about the data. Um, yeah. Because things have changed so much. I mean, my husband used to go to BART every day and now he hasn't been in two years and his company yeah. is talking about when he does return over two days a week. 
So the data from before doesn't match what's going on in our city now. How confident are you that this plan will still work with our new reality? Hmm. Yeah, I, I think, you know, again, you know, you all, you all are the experts, right? You, you tell, you tell me, but I think the, the plan, the, you know, recommended network is comprehensive and connects and goes to the plate, the places that people want to go to, even if you're not going to BART, every day folks aren't going to work every day there's still a bart station in town right and there's 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 additional housing being built around that and and there's a hospital nearby all those places still exist people still need to go there even if they're going at, at different times or different days of the week the the peaks are different but the the desire to go to those places is still there and so that would be you know how i would say, does this work? I think it still connects to those places, schools, kids okay. still going to school, downtown, um, you know, the East of 101. If we're, if we've made those connections, I, I think it still works. And yeah, we could spend a bunch of time and money, frankly, like going back and revising all those like LTS or this and that to try to adjust. I, there's not a lot of value to doing that at this point in the plan. Okay. I mean, honestly, <laughs> even the safety data, we started this plan in 2018. So the safety data we had was like through 2017 it's a little out of date but i i would say if we got that extra three years of data it's going to generally tell us the same things right that people you know el camino real is really challenging to cross and there's a bunch of crashes there um so you know it's always great to have more data but at some point we have to sort of say all right we've done that existing piece and let's really focus on making sure this makes sense. And I'd say you all and the public are the ones who are gonna be able to say, yeah, this this works for us. This is our vision as a community. Um, the data is just a tool we use along the way to help. Okay, um, yeah. that's what I wanted to hear. Thank you very much. <laughs> and, and if I may, uh, I know uh, committee member, you have asked a question, but if I might like, with regards to our data collection, we're still pretty confident that, of what Brett and his team has uh, collected. and they are still in line with the realities we're in, even with the pandemic. So in a similar effort that just I was just that was just completed recently, I believe Frank was on that too, the local road safety plan, um, collecting a bunch of data from like uh, collisions um, throughout the city and identified like specific corridors where we can target like specific responses. Um, to to do like spot treatments and things like that. And that whole effort uh, was just to make sure that we have that plan so we can compete for funding from Caltrans. It said the same story, like the same things that we had ha hot spots on and, you know, like the, it, it's the same types of locations, maybe not the same, you know, intersections, but it's the same corridor that had those problems and, and it just confirms what we generally um, are aware of. And as far as like the, the, the the reality now that like not everybody's going back to work uh you know i'm gonna keep promising frank that we'll meet in person but that's not happening not in the next like few months for sure so yeah. breaking that promise for to frank uh, as the months go on but you know like it further reinforces the need to have these connective yeah. connected facilities because we're at home more and yeah like, that's what i think the, right we're so, at home more. so there, there's value in that so just uh, like what i wanted to highlight was like just be ready for the fight that comes when we have like, let's say, you know, select some facilities that we want to make sure we study and, you know, install a class for, and then we have to take some parking away from folks. Just be ready for that. <laughs> all right. right. So, well, I'm glad you're confident. Thank you, Chris. That's really- Oh, I'm not confident. I need all the backup I can <laughs> get. So. Oh, you seem confident. Thank you for sharing. Yeah, and thank you, Brett, for your presentation. And uh, just to finish off then. Oh, wait, Daryl had a sorry, question. Daryl had a question, Frank. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Oh, oh so, okay. Uh, yeah, I have a, I read this draft um, yesterday and uh, I have a few comments from that. I just wanted to share it with the committee and staff. Um, first of all, I want to thank the city for working on this. Um, this is the, the document that I was excited about when I uh, got appointed to BPAC because um, it shows a vision for the city. Um, and I wasn't involved in the early stages of this document, but I really like uh, the goals and I really like the focus on infrastructure. because That's where we can make the best change. Um, and it's a lot better than the last plan from a decade ago. Uh, second, uh, Chris just mentioned the local road safety plan. 
Um, I would love to see more components of whatever that plan is. I'm not familiar with what it is. Um, to be incorporated into this document, um, the city recently passed Vision Zero, um, but there's a few things in Vision Zero that I would have expected to see in the active transportation plan that aren't like uh, enforcement and evaluation, which aren't in this plan at all. And then the next one is a lot of this plan is in the form of recommendations. It recommends a lot of treatments, um, but I think we should work for more than just recommendations and work with our city council uh, to create policies that, that make sure that these actually get implemented. Um, among a lot of other recommendations. Um, on the implementation chapter, I really like how the evaluation of the implementation of all the proposed um, infrastructure changes focused on impact and feasibility, uh, because I think we can make a big difference by doing low cost improvements on the most heavily traveled areas. Uh, and then we could use that to get more funding. So I really like that chapter and hopefully I encourage all the rest of the committee members to look at that chapter really closely because that that is the plan. Um, and then lastly, I mentioned this already, but I want to reiterate that a uh, component of this plan that I think is sorely missing, and I believe a couple other committee members mentioned that, is that uh, there's no mention of enforcement of parking regulations. You can't have active transportation uh, without uh, slow cars that don't uh, block pedestrian and bicycle access. Um, oh, and then my very last comment is, I think this plan should also fight for the need for more transportation planners for South City. The fact that Chris is the only one and that he wears multiple hats um, is a call for the city to invest in more transportation planners. Uh, and that's it. Thank you. Yes, I agree with Daryl. Chris, you're doing a great job, but can you clone yourself? <laughs> <laughs> And and uh, Brett has and his team did a great job with this, so thank you to them. And I, Daryl, I don't know. I call all the time about parking and nothing changes, so we would definitely need it added to the plan somehow. One uh, one thing that I feel like is uh, I, I don't know really whether the plan is the appropriate place for this or where it is, and it's been brought up a bunch of times before here, but we don't have a bike shop in this town, and I. Uh, I don't have the resources to start my own bike shop and I, I have a different job, but gosh, I would love it. Do we, do we need like a public bike shop in South city? Is that possible? Can we taxpayer fund a bike shop, like feed the money back into the city and pay for libraries or some shit? Like I would just love uh, that, but um, yeah, I don't know. Maybe we can pay someone to come start their shop here. Alan Gorman is really great. He's in like Burlingame, I think, which isn't too far, but uh yeah, he runs a small shop, and I'm like, man, move up here. Come hang out. Go to Grand. A little spot on Grand Ave. Yeah. Hello, Maddie. Thanks so much for our wish list. Um, so any, any more comments, you know, put them in writing and send them to Chris before February 16th. Mm -hmm. Or earlier. So or earlier, I can <laughs> yeah. lean on Brett to be like, let's publish it. Uh, I believe there's a holiday, the President's Day on the 21st. So I can harass Brett on the 22nd, but like, let's publish this thing. Yeah, if you're if they're ready to go, send them in. Uh, we wanted to at least give you a couple weeks as courtesy, but um, earlier is All better right. for us for sure. Sounds, sounds fair. So, um, Frank, right. sorry, if I may. Um, I know that the link that I sent you to review this admin draft was read only. I'll resend that to you tonight. Um, so you'd be able to download it, but please give me, get, take, take your time with it and then make sure you send me your comments through, and you'll be able to add it to the PDF. I'll kind of like collect them and send them to Brett. So he doesn't have to do that, um, but make sure you do it by the 16th or earlier. Gotcha. Yeah. Why don't we focus on February 11th? February 11th, Frank. I've... Well, like, is it because you got the holiday then? That the 14th is the holiday? Uh, no, the uh, 21st is the holiday, I believe. No, oh, okay. Well, sooner the better. Yeah, sooner the better. Right. That's the that's the key takeaway. All right. All right. Again, Brett, thank you very much. We'll yeah, thank this. you, Brett. You bet. Yeah, look forward to your comments and getting this uh, getting this thing out. All right. 
So next item, any uh, comments from the board? I do have a comment. Um, I want to make this a habit in this committee that anytime that there is a fatality um, on our roadways that we commemorate it. Um, I just want to mention that last Thursday there was a fatal collision uh, east of 101 on East Grant and Forbes. Um, the police report stated that they didn't release a name yet, but the police report stated that the pedestrian may have been crossing outside the crosswalk against a red light during during the darkness. And I don't want that statement to be implied as blaming pedestrians. I want that to be stated as something that the city, um, given that it has a vision zero plan, um, needs to make sure that there are adequate crosswalks where people are able to cross that it's well lighted. So vehicles drive or drivers and vehicles can see the pedestrians and that we have those connections. I think this plan really should enforce that and hopefully we can work towards that. Um, so every month I'm going to come and try to do this and hopefully we can encourage um, our city council to also acknowledge um, any pedestrian fatality or bicyclist fatality in our city. That's an interesting point. Did the police used to update us on uh, accidents, Chris, didn't they, when I started? I, I believe so. Um, for this one, I am aware of it. it just I. Um, the last I heard is still under investigation, so that's why I'm I, like. But uh, I'll I'll inquire. But no, thank you, uh, committee member Yip, for taking this on. And yeah. hopefully, you don't have to update us with like these types of things. Um, but it's it's worth acknowledging, given that we are a Vision Zero city. I uh, shared a interesting video I encountered about how city in the Netherlands addresses or thinks about these kinds of things, which really focused on trying to understand why certain types of crashes happen rather than sort of focusing on what like the person or a cyclist or a car or anything might have done wrong, focusing on what what aspects of the road and the infrastructure might have facilitated or made that easier to happen. And that could be as simple as like, maybe there needs to be a narrower street or, you know, speed bumps, whatever they cover it in the video, but I found it to be really interesting because I, I do think that sometimes that we kind of skip over these things. So uh, thanks for bringing that up, Daryl. It's a good point. Yeah, good point. Okay, any other comments? Hearing none, do I have a motion to adjourn? I see Reno nod his head. I think that is yes, a yes. Aye. <laughs> uh, a aye motion, we adjourn. Are in the second? All those in favor of saying aye? Aye. aye. Opposed? Aye. Thank you, everyone. Aye. Thank, Thank you. you very much. The meeting is adjourned at 7 26. Six. All right. Thank you, everybody. We'll see Thanks, you in March. Everyone. Have a good night. Right. Take care.